In late 2002, a mysterious disease with pneumonia-like symptoms emerged seemingly out of nowhere. Over the next year, what became known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, infected more than 8,000 people around the globe and killed 775. It confounded healthcare workers who were unsure how it spread and how to treat it. After invading Taiwan, SARS escalated into a crisis that is still a painful memory today. Tonight, in the first part of our special report on SARS, we revisit the unfolding of an epidemic that would go on to shape public policy for years to come. In 2003, not long after the Lunar New Year holiday, a never-before-seen disease took hold of Asia. A few months earlier, news began spreading online that there was a highly contagious, highly fatal disease spreading in China. Doctors were said to be calling it an atypical pneumonia, although Chinese officials refused to confirm the reports. Finally, on February 10, 2003, China reported to the World Health Organization that in Guangdong province, 305 people had contracted SARS. Five of them had died. What was unusual about the outbreak was that one-third of those infected were medical personnel. How do medical personnel contract illnesses? Healthcare workers frequently come in contact with many types of diseases, viruses and bacteria. They've had it all before, so they're mostly immune to all manner of viruses. So when an illness strikes two or three medical staff at the same time, we'd find that very strange. How can they be infected like this at the same time? Could it be that nobody has the antibodies for it and it's a new disease? At that time, we already had suspicions that this was a new contagious disease. One month later, SARS arrived in Taiwan. On March 8, 2003, the emergency room at the National Taiwan University Hospital treated a patient who had returned to Taiwan from China and presented a cough and high fever. After being admitted, the patient developed breathing difficulties and was transferred to intensive care. It was something the doctors had not seen before. Not only was the patient's deterioration fast, less than one week later, his wife was hospitalized too. More importantly, his wife came in six days later. That made two people in one household. Our emergency room specialist felt that something was wrong and notified the infectious diseases department. Professor Zhang Shangchun told us that this could be Taiwan's first SARS patient. Then, another six days later, the child also came in, so the family was hospitalized. The son of a businessman, surnamed Qin, was doing his alternative military service at the Taiwan Centers for Disease Control. When his father came back from Guangdong, China, the son sensed that something was off and he notified the CDC. Actually, it was the CDC that notified NTU about the case. His son happened to be working with us at the time. Both sides understood that this might be a case of SARS. Health authorities and medical staff were at wit's end. What they were facing was a never-before-seen invisible enemy. The U.S.'s Centers for Disease Control sent specialists to Taiwan to provide support. If this is some type of bacteria or virus, then it is one that has mutated considerably. It is not any of the viruses or bacteria that existed before. Besides being caused by bacteria, atypical pneumonia can be caused by filtrable viruses, or a type of bacteria like mycoplasma and chlamydia. Later, the WHO confirmed that the cause of the disease was a coronavirus, a type of virus named for its spherical and crown-like appearance. The WHO gave the disease a name, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. Our bodies have DNA. When the coronavirus binds to the host, it uses its RNA to create something like DNA, which it inserts in the host. This false DNA cannot be identified and expelled by the host. That's how the coronavirus uses the host to produce large quantities of itself. Then those viruses go out into the body, infecting other cells. The coronavirus works fast. It can hijack your cells in no time at all. Once the first case of SARS appeared, others began cropping up. 
One infection cluster was a group of employees who contracted the virus on a flight from Hong Kong to Beijing. Our Deputy Health Director Li Longtang had already met with the Executive UN. He said that since there was this case involving a Taiwanese businessman from China, we should close the border. Of course, he was immediately overruled. Afterward, he was very unhappy. He said more cases have arrived. He said that if we did not close the border, more would keep coming because we had such close and frequent interactions with China. On March 27th, the government classified SARS as an infectious disease and announced home isolation measures. As Taiwan raced to contain the outbreak, it was also working out methods of diagnosing infection. Doctors were facing an unknown disease and there was scant data on which to base their diagnoses. It took a long time to work out how to confirm a SARS infection. All doctors in clinical practice rely on their experience, but if none of them have experience with a disease, because it's a new disease, then there are many instances in which there is no way to decide anything. So on the patient reports, we added an option indicating a possible infection. By the end of March, China had nearly 400 confirmed cases. In Guangdong alone, there were 361 cases, including nine deaths. Neighboring Hong Kong had 316 cases, including 10 deaths. Vietnam had 58 cases, including four deaths. Around this time, the WHO issued an infectious disease alert for China, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. At the time, Taiwan had 11 confirmed SARS cases, but no deaths, no exported cases, and no reports of community infections. That didn't last long. In early April, a woman with a fever checked into Taipei City Hospital's Heping branch before being transferred to an isolation ward at Xinkong Memorial Hospital. At the time, specialists were uncertain whether the woman had SARS. According to her family's report, she had been in contact with other infected people. But our team of specialists can only base findings on what the patient herself said, since only that counts as valid evidence. On the basis of such a position, we are treating her as a potential case who is awaiting testing. Nobody could have imagined that her brief stay at Heping Hospital would leave an outbreak in her wake. You have to realize that at a hospital, you go, you get tests done, and you come into contact with so many people. At a time, a radiologist was infected. If they think a patient has a respiratory tract infection, they'll run an X-ray. Looking back, it appears that the patient, Ms. Tao, and a hospital janitor had been the main sources of transmission. Seven people at Heping Hospital, including lab technicians, nurses, laundry workers, and administrative staff, developed symptoms including a high fever and coughing. An outbreak of SARS had hit Heping Hospital. Heping At noon on April 24, 2003, security workers sealed off Heping Hospital, pulling down its metal gates. All the hospital's medical personnel were ordered to stay inside. The team of specialists arrived at the decision during a meeting. The idea was, at this point, what action can be taken to reduce the chance of community transmission? We need to close it down so that the people inside don't spread it and we don't end up with household transmission and other community transmission. Right after our meeting, a colleague told me we'd received a fax. This fax was an official notice from the health ministry ordering us to lock down the hospital and prohibit anyone from going in or out. This order was to take immediate effect. It was immediate. It was the first time a hospital in Taiwan went under lockdown. 
Those inside included patients, their families, and medical personnel. Many were highly anxious. Some were angry and attempted to break free from the hospital. The situation spiraled into a crisis. It was diffused only after retired Taipei Health Director Ye Jingchuan volunteered to go into the hospital and remain with those trapped within. All our resources went to supporting those inside the hospital. We were all very concerned about the situation in there. I went in to work with the staff there and we came out of the hospital together. We worked together and came out together and we overcame SARS. The hospital staff carried on. Highly contagious patients were isolated and treatment was provided. But despite it all, 57 staff members came down with SARS, seven of whom died. Another 97 people who were in quarantine were also infected. 24 of them died, including one who committed suicide. The lockdown of Heping Hospital was not enough to stop SARS. On April 29th, nearby Renji Hospital reported an outbreak and a lockdown of its own. Taiwan's battle with SARS was only beginning. Taiwan's SARS crisis wasn't over with the lockdown of Herping Hospital. Join us next Sunday as we revisit what happened next.